here in Berkeley and to see this work grow here in the city. Now, we're always asked two questions about 360 Church. One is, what in the world does the name mean? And uh, it's really very simple. We started as a church with no name, like a horse with no name, except a church. <laughs> 360 means we have three commitments to God, to creative people, and to the connection between the two. We live those three commitments the other six days of the week because really Sunday's easy if you have good music. And we do that with zero regrets, three, six, zero. So we actually wrote our mission into our name and that's what it stands for. The other question is, how did you get called to Berkeley? And the truth is we were never called, we were kidnapped. Uh, we used to have a life. I had a dental plan, we had 401k, we were living on five beautiful wooded acres, three miles from the Mark Twain National Forest in southwest Missouri, and then bada bing, bada boom, and here we are in Berkeley. Somehow it, it, it all transpired, and what, what really goes on is a, a new church starts in the heart of God because God loves his city. God loves all the cities. I think he's really got a special heart for this place because really it's, 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 it's just great. This is a great city. This campus is, it's wonderful. I mean, I, I see the shortcomings and the faults and failings and all of it, but God has a powerful love for this place. And that comes from the heart of God into the heart of one or more people. And they start to feel what God feels for a place. And it's kind of like a marriage. You have the love first, and out of that comes the relationship. You have the love first, and out of that comes the desire to see if a new faith community will form there to serve that place and to be a, a, a reflection of God's love for the city to the people who live there, especially the people who are exploring faith or restoring faith, or my favorite, deploring faith. They all need and can receive the love of God. Now, the best description of that, I guess, that I know of in the New Testament is found in Ephesians chapter 4. It begins at verse 11, and I'll just read it for you. It says of Jesus, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, by deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. When a church starts and it grows, it should look like that. That should be our history. That should be our future. That should be our always. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2013 State of the Church address. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, there we were minding our own business, living on our five acres in the only house we ever built, a beautiful split level home. It was our dream home. I had a job as a seminary administrator and professor. My wife was a full-time student. She was earning her doctorate at this graduate school. And uh, we were prepared to put our life uh, into basically a cruise control mode, stack up some mutual funds, you know how you do, and uh, prepare ourselves to uh, take a Lipitor and baby aspirin so we could have some retirement uh, at the end of our lives and keep our health going. Everything was going to just be great. We could take bus tours to Branson to see the leaves and it was all going to work out so well once I had wrapped up my career. Uh, and then we got uh, an email from a friend of mine who uh, was the first of the kidnappers, and he said, Earl, would uh, who would you recommend to lead a church planting team in Berkeley, California? And Janet said to me, remember, she's the other kidnapper in this little drama, send him back a joking reply, and the joke is, are you taking applications from senior citizens? Send, because we have a mirror in our house. He responded to us, uh, actually, you guys were our first choice. We were just sure you would say no which is completely correct. We were prepared to say no. There's no way we're going to do it. 
but we did get on an airplane and flew out here early in 2007 toured the campus, we saw Cal for the first time, we've never been here, all we knew what was on Google, that was it, and we saw a little bit of the city, we ate brunch at the Okoka Lake Cafe on the corner of University and Milvia, we saw a street guy smashing bottles against a wall and shouting profanity, it was a classic Berkeley Sunday morning. <laughs> 360 began as a church in our heart. And what happened to us was when we saw the city and the campus and its influence in the world, when we saw the power of it. Do you know what I mean by that? Do you know why Ben's able to say the Bay Area is so busy? Because people in this area make the world happen. This is where a lot of what we all live comes from within 10 or 15 or 20 miles of this spot. Uh, with Cal, the, the other school across the bay, Silicon Valley in between, mm -hmm. and all of it. This may be the biggest single concentration of creative people in the history of human civilization. Now, I can't prove that. Maybe I'm wrong and it's only number five. But even so, we saw that cultural creatives were here in a tremendous density. We recognized, as the slogan goes here, as Berkeley goes, so goes the nation. Do you know why there'll be uh, no smoking in the, the restaurant where you'll have a burger this afternoon? Because the first non-smoking ordinance in the United States was passed in this city. Housing was first desegregated in the United States in this city. The first handicapped ramp was cut into a sidewalk, number one, in this city. The independent living movement started in this city and we invented the wetsuit and the polygraph. It all starts right here. That We had never had a sense of that before. That there's creativity everywhere, but it is not equally distributed, and there's a ton of it right here. And our thought was, if these creatives can get in touch with God, their creator, through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, and God's love and compassion and mercy and it just starts to pour into their lives and, and the, what Ephesians calls the eyes of their hearts are open and they begin to see the world with God eyes instead of with me eyes they would begin to develop ideas and solutions and policies and programs and new thoughts and so forth that could change the world without a war well. change everything with no drones change everything with no international conglomerates. Change everything with no distinction between one percenters and 99 percenters. Just change everything. Because they would be investing their lives in creating stuff, get this, track with me now, that helped people. I, I, I don't mean the 15th app on the iPhone to recognize the music on the PA in the store where you're shopping. No offense to you app designers. Really, we love you. We're so grateful for all these apps. But really, after Shazam, was there a reason to go on? <laughs> Somewhere out there in the dorm room this afternoon, somebody's developing app number 15 to make a living. That's all good. I'm all for it. And it's way better than being homeless. I totally get that. But what if you took that energy and it, 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 it invested it in, in getting rid of malaria this year instead of five years out. We thought that's the kind of way people could think and act. The world is the way it is because the people who could fix it either can't or won't. And God's best two categories are can't and won't. That's true. When Jesus gets into your life, he messes you up totally. Don't, don't consider faith because it will make things better. It will make things worse really well. I know that's bad marketing, but believe me, he, 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 will, he will invade your life and flip your categories over and bust out all your walls and get you caring about stuff and people you never cared for before. You're going to get all distracted by dreams and visions and directions from a wonderful God who's going to start to use you powerfully. Now, you may be in your same house, your same car, your same job, you're, you're absolutely same everything, but you will bring new eyes to it and new hands to it and new feet to it and a new power to it and you can make the world closer to what God wants it to be because Jesus is alive in his heart and if he were standing there physically that's what he'd do better world no drones the church started in our heart that's what we felt when we came here we went home I quit my job we sold our house to a woman from California <laughs> 
about four weeks before the real estate crash. We got out from under, we scraped up a little pile of equity, like just enough to put in your hip pocket in California terms, just a little pile. And we put it in the bank, we left our big old house, we downsized everything, we took it all to the Salvation Army. Listen, that's where it's going anyway in the end. So save your family a trip and just get it all down there now. That's what we did. And uh, we moved into a basement and we lived in a basement for a year and a half. We, we like to call it our global ministry headquarters. <laughs> we traveled the United States raising money and prayer support in the network of churches that 360 is a part. It's called the Assemblies of God. If you're not familiar with it, we have 13,000 congregations in the United States, about 30,000 ministers, and uh, we're much, much, much bigger outside the US than we are inside. About 1% of the world's population uh, is part of that network. We traveled throughout it in the U.S., raising money for a couple of years, keeping that little pile of equity in our hip pocket, hoping there might be a place, looking for a place to live uh, in uh, Berkeley. And we were able to actually move here late in December of 2008. We moved into an abandoned, repossessed home mm -hmm. uh, in South Central Berkeley in the middle of the gang war. For the first time in my life, I saw an actual, not on TV or movies, but actual police tape part of a street off with shell casings on the asphalt. I actually saw that. Uh, since I've been here, I've heard gunfire. Uh, I've, I've seen a young man die in the street with bullet holes in his body. Uh, we're that is that's life here in part of the East Bay. That's the other Berkeley. <laughs> that's the other Berkeley. That's where we moved. Our security system at our house was a piece of masking tape over the hole in the front door where the lock used to be. Like the burglars are gonna come up to that and say, dang, we're gonna have to rob somebody else. He's got masking tape. That was all we had. January 2009, two friends from Arizona showed up and with us, they stayed over for a Sunday. We held the very first Sunday morning prayer meeting in our living room, the four of us. We're busting out. Mm -hmm. And during that time, we met two Cal students who contacted us on the, email, on, on the internet. Their names were Malia and Torin Jones. Mm -hmm. They came over to our house and had dinner with us. Two really old white people. <laughs> and it was awkward. So we didn't know each other. Never met each other. Never seen each other's face. But they were so sweet to us, and so encouraging, and so kind to us. Today, Malia is studying her MA at Sarah Lawrence, and her brother Torin is uh, at Cambridge. I sent Malia a Facebook message this morning, uh, telling her that we would be telling their story again and putting up. Uh, a really grainy, awful, looks like surveillance video picture <laughs> that was taken with, do you remember what a Palm Pilot is? <laughs> That's the tech I had at the time I took all this, so I apologize in advance for the quality of the graphics. These guys actually uh, would talk to us and we afterwards we would think like, they actually think this could happen. <laughs> they would come over and we would eat, we'd eat food together and they encouraged us <laughs> to think about uh, doing something in our home, and so we became a <coughs> church in a house. Mm -hmm. Now, the cultural creative idea was still in our hearts, but it needs a vehicle to be expressed. Uh, the church in our house had a very simple concept behind it, and the concept was we would gather around our dining room table, which was our first venue, by the way, mm -hmm. and uh, we would have a, a dinner together. I would do a Bible study, but the real power behind this approach was Janet's comfort food cooking. Uh, we're talking bacon and eggs, very oh. not PC stuff. Uh, meatloaf, holy cow, don't tell your mom. And uh, things like chicken and dumplings. And so uh, I would teach from the scripture and she would bring the comfort food cooking and this would beat the sin out of your heart. <laughs> Just a, chicken and dumplings, sin out, it's gone, you're good. And together, we started having fun. Uh, around the dining room table doing this sort of every Thursday night and early on in this process uh, we actually had a, a neighboring church uh, down in Fremont Harbor Light on a Sunday morning service officially transfer our very first person to us and that was Natasha can you wave at everybody Woo! we call her patient zero because she's the one that the infection started with and kind of 
Spread. We were there on a Sunday morning, and they they said some formal words. It was like a trade in baseball, you know, for a future yeah. draft pick and an undisclosed amount of cash kind of thing. <laughs> and, like she came out and went with us, and she has been with us ever since. Now in March, the band that Natasha founded will lead worship at her home church down in Fremont on a Sunday morning for their missions convention. So you reap what you sow, don't you? They sowed one person and they have reaped a six person plus awesome tech crew worship <laughs> band, almost all of which speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> so you tell me how that all functions. So Natasha joins us and we form the 360 Church nonprofit corporation doing all that legal paperwork. And we're taking care of all that stuff in the background while church in our house is continuing. Now, Church in Our House is a lot of fun. We're really enjoying it. Uh, we're, we're growing a little bit. And so as we start to grow a little bit, we, we have to change venues. So we move from the dining room to the living room. That's location number two. And now there's a slightly bigger group. And in this circle, we hold our very first mission service, which the speakers actually sat in front of my television and showed PowerPoint slides on the TV. And we were like, oh, dude, that's awesome. You know, when you have nothing, Everything is awesome. Right. <laughs> you should try. There's a real downside to having a lot of stuff because nothing is awesome for you anymore. Uh -huh. So my advice is to complete the vesture, do the Salvation Army thing, and suddenly everything will be awesome for you. So we're sitting in these circles and we're loving, we're thinking this is great, except that what Thursday night has become is a midweek service for people who are already going somewhere else on Sunday morning. Nothing wrong with that. that that's all fine. But that's not what we came for. Now we're on target, our focal group, the cultural creatives, that's who we're working with. And we've got Cal students, thank God. But it's just not what we came here for. And so uh, Natasha and Jan and I, who were the board of directors, because the, when we formed one, we were the only three people in the church, and that's what we were all there was. We talked about what we should do, and we decided we would shoot church in a house in the head. And we picked a Sunday morning, Easter of 2010 and decided that we would move our Sunday morning service in an off-Broadway preview mode into a small conference room called the University Room at the Hotel Durant on Durant Avenue. It's just a couple blocks from the Cal campus. And we became church in a bag. We now had just enough equipment that we could take everything we owned to do a service in one tote bag. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have located that bag, and my wife Janet is going to display it for you this morning. There it is. This is church in the bag. Now, when we started, all we needed was we had a, a pad of paper to write your name and email down if you were a visitor, because uh, there probably wasn't much chance you were going to come back, but at least we could stay in touch by email. We also put in a tray, which we are still looking for, by the way, from which we serve the communion elements uh, out of orange plastic cups that we bought at Target. And uh, then we had a Bible because it's, that's important to have one of those. And uh, a couple of other miscellaneous things. We started out uh, with our main miscellaneous item being uh, M&Ms. It was our official candy for a while. Everybody really liked it. Then we found out about the whole fair trade issue and all these other things that we discontinued. <laughs> uh, but we went from nothing to, I mean, literally everything. We had, we had no instruments, no equipment, no PA, zero. Everything we needed fit in one bag. And you know what? That's not so bad because nobody can stop you when you have nothing. Yeah. Nobody can take your stuff away because you've got no stuff. I would give up all our stuff in a second and go back to being a, a network of house churches to hold on to the dynamic of what we are. Mm -hmm. In this bag were the seeds of what we would later become. Now the university room uh, was the shape of a bowling alley, uh, not the entire bowling alley, just one lane. <laughs> one lane, very long and narrow. And we began around round tables with eight of us on Easter 2010. Seven of those eight people, which includes Jan and me, are still with us today. Who's part of the original gang of eight? Randy, Mark Natasha, Mark and Semra, Ben, 
So almost everybody is still a part of the fellowship. Uh, we began to worship together. I'd teach the Bible. All we really did was took church in a house and moved the dining room table to the hotel. Or it was just a different table in a different shape. Uh, we would still uh, teach. We would have communion together. We would go out for lunch every Sunday together because there were so few of us we could fit around one table at lunch too. And people began to come. We were close to the campus. We began to attract more visitors, people who are outside of faith, more deploring faith, exploring faith, restoring faith people uh, began to come there. Uh, we would sing from the lyric sheets printed a cappella. Awesome. Just like Paul in prison, baby. Here we are, singing a cappella for Jesus. We don't need no fancy band. That's right. And then Mark brought his guitar and began uh, worshiping in the two song worship service format. <laughs> because we just pretty much, he was working on two songs at a time, getting ready, and he was just getting into the guitar, and his fingertips were still tender. I mean, really, you know how it is when you're just starting, if you've ever tried to get up to speed? He was killing himself to do this. He said agony to get through the end of the second song, and we did that two-song worship service. That was how we began. Then the Oklahoma District, which is part of that network I mentioned before, bought us a, a keyboard, and we went up to Guitar Center and got this guitar amp behind me. Mark had his guitar. We plugged everything into the guitar amp, and we had a PA system. Mm. A Shure SM58 mic, and you are ready to rock, my <coughs> friends. Uh, we realized that the university room, which when you set it up with chairs on either side, looked exactly like the inside of a Southwest Airlines jet, <laughs> was not going to be large <laughs> enough or conducive to extra growth because the people in the back were 50 feet away and everybody else was squished together. And so we had another venue change. This is location four at this point to the California room, which is upstairs in the same hotel. Now at this point, we have so much gear that we become church in a car. We have a keyboard, we have an amp, we have a couple of guitars, we have music stands, holy cow. We've lost the first communion platter, but we've got another one. We have all kinds of stuff, so much stuff that to move it to where we meet in the hotel, we have to pack it all into the back of our old 2002 Volvo S40, which is a car we don't even own anymore. And we have to store it in between services in the warehouse which is the garage at my home. Now, Wednesday nights, the band is practicing in our living room with the keyboard hooked up beside the television and the musicians on the couches and chairs around and Natasha's up there leading from the TV and Jan and I are going out for a coffee date on Wednesday night, which was lovely, really. We really liked it. We would leave our house and uh, they would serenade the neighbors and then they would load all the stuff back into the warehouse where it would sit and mold until the next Sunday morning. Now at this point, we we, we, we have some stuff and we're we're growing a little bit. Our, our, our first Easter uh, up on the Cal campus, uh, it, it's, it's just Janet and me and a Finch who hopped up to join us. Our second Easter in the Hotel Durant, there's eight of us. Our, our third Easter, our last day in the Hotel Durant, there's about 20 of us. And we realize that we're not gonna go any further unless we get a venue people can actually find. Because as fun as it is to locate a hotel, go in the dark, creepy Adams Family Lobby, up and around the stairs, <laughs> and all the way to the back of a building you've never visited before, we thought maybe a building you could find would be better. And so we began to search for another place to meet, which would be on Broadway. And uh, we located this place uh, with the help of a, a realtor who was a great guy, who when we told him uh, what we wanted to do and how much we wanted to pay, he laughed in our face. <laughs> now, this being California real estate, it's an experience I've had before. <laughs> and so we just prayed. We just prayed. Negotiations broke down. It's California real estate. You know, that's always going to happen. Bridges are out. Nothing's happening for months. And all of a sudden, we felt this kind of impulse to get back in it. The coach we work with said, well, just, you know, raise it a little bit and go back to it. We came back, and our very gracious, kind uh, building owner felt that it was a deal that he could make. And we were able to sign uh, a, a lease on this location. Yeah. We moved uh, right after Easter of 2011 into this space for about three months in the summer of that year, renovating. And we painted, we did everything. This space was originally a cube farm. <laughs> a company was located here, they went out of business. All of the cube partitions are still stacked back there in the warehouse and other places uh, to be restored should they ever wish to come back. And uh, we felt like 
to have 4,000 square feet in downtown Berkeley for what we're paying for it, this close to campus, this close to BART, this close to the high school, this close. Because in, in our perspective uh, on how to do a church startup is to go to people rather than asking them to come to you. Mm. And so the closer we could get, the better off we felt like we were. And uh, the, a church in Oklahoma bought us these chairs. We also had a church in San Mateo loan us the sound system, uh, and another church in San Mateo loaned us, or rather gave us the uh, black drum set that we have here. Uh, lots and lots of other stuff were donated. Uh, the couches to my left were lovely, and we had a couple of individuals and churches step up and provide our children's spaces and some funding for our wonderful children's director. And then we took the biggest single shopping trip in the history of Ikea. And we became the church from Ikea. We went down there and cleaned that bad boy out. Did I tell you, is it big? We cleaned them out. We picked them clean. <laughs> Couches and chairs and these cool little tables we use for everything. We just cleaned them out. And the reason we went to Ikea was very simple because we felt like that's the kind of furniture that a person who's part of this cultural creative group uses in their first apartment. And it should feel like the place where you live, the place where you're from. We organized for a grand opening on August the 28th of uh, uh, 2011. We started here with a grand opening on that day. Uh, early in 2012, we started our very first 360 Homes uh, small group, which you'll hear more about a little later today and a lot about next week uh, to begin our home Bible study network. Uh, in summer uh, of 2012, Jeff and Erica Sandstrom, who were our associate pastors at the time left to plant a church in Plainfield, Illinois, in the southwest suburbs of Chicago. Uh, that's our first church plant from here, which 10 months out from your grand opening isn't bad. That, that's pretty good. Uh, then in the fall, uh, LaShawn joined us as our 360 Kids director, which was, which was wonderful. Uh, and we have seen God do just unbelievable stuff as we continue this journey into the future. Now that brings us up to today. And here's where I think we go from here. Uh, the first and most important thing is I want to be water baptizing people who are new to faith every Sunday morning. Now when I say that to people, they say, that's not really possible. And I say to them, that's true, but then none of this has ever really been possible, has it? Yeah. You know, when people say, why did you persist in this? Uh, the reason is, it, the miracles wouldn't stop. We should never have had a home here. We should never have been able to raise a budget in the depths of what's now called the Great Recession. We, have never, we should never have been able to adapt from our Midwestern roots to this sort of Bay Area everythingness <laughs> that's here. We shouldn't, we, we're, we're not the right demographic. We're, the average church planter is, would be the age of my grandchildren. I mean, we get all of that. But God just kept opening one door after another, after another, after another. And sometimes it was like, dang, got to keep going forward. <laughs> but the Lord would just... He would bomb things in on us like this space, which shouldn't be here and should not be available to a group like us. And because it wouldn't quit, then neither will we. And if we don't quit, I believe we're going to come to a place where we are water baptizing people who are new to faith all the time. I mean, here's my perfect service. People are going, when is this going to end? How many baptisms today? <laughs> Jeez, couldn't they do them Sunday night or something? I mean, I've got a lunch date. If you feel that, God bless you. God bless you. It's just a kind of watch looking, where's my text? I've got to take this call frustration that I am praying for. <laughs> if we are really relevant and fruitful in this community, people who are exploring, deploring, 
or what's the other one? Restoring faith or going to find God through faith in Jesus Christ and we will be baptizing them in water. Maybe not in this building, maybe in swimming pools, maybe in the fountains of Cal, I don't care, but that, that is my venture. <laughs> I've got plans about that. The second thing that we need to have happen this year is prayer has to become a centerpiece of our corporate culture. Mm. People say, what's your brand? And uh, I understand that. I mean, we market, we use social media, we have a wonderful social media director, we, we, we do all of that stuff. But what I want people to say when they have been in a small group with us one-to-one -one or in a large group is I want them to leave thinking, wow. That was, that was not what I expected. That was more than I expected. God did something in my life. I, I, I need to connect with God again like that. And prayer will bring that into our midst. Uh, if it's not, then our prayer life as a group is going to be like singing the national anthem before the ball game, and our production values will become the ball game. Wow. I'm all for good production. I'm against bad production. Very against it. But it's got to rise and fall on a tide of our calling out to God in the name of Jesus and asking him to send his power on this. So you, know what I, you know what I was praying for this week? Here's what I was praying for. I was praying for stuff to happen through this congregation and your individual lives that would have so much impact that it would become a Google search term. You understand what I mean by that? Like you would look up the Civil War you would look up the, the stuff that happened in Berkeley in 2013. <laughs> if we pray, that's what will happen. Yeah. That's what will happen. The third thing that's really crucial this year is that this is our year of global action. Uh, Charity Jensen, who you met today, is our missions director. And this is going to be a year when our awareness of the needs of the world uh, is just going to expand massively. Uh, in terms of, of giving to support people who, who go to bring the good news, in terms of serving right here in our local community, uh, and in terms of going ourselves, perhaps in teams or individuals or groups. This is our year of the world, uh, a year where we can uh, take what's, what's happened here and just expand the perimeter of it so much. And once you get a taste of that and you, and, and you see that close up, you know, when I saw that kid die in the street, that did something to me. I'm not the same person I was the day. It's not like the movies, friends. I'm not the guy I was the hour before that happened. And when you see the world through the eyes of Jesus close up like that, when you're serving and giving, when you're right there, it's going to get in you. Yeah. And it's going to do something that just words and teachings and all that other stuff, as good as and necessary as it is, it, it, it just can't do. The fourth thing is, uh, we really need another facility because this building is going to be demolished. <laughs> I think we're unanimous on that. Uh, now, we have some time. It won't be before the end of the year. Uh, but we are actively looking for a functional facility uh, that could just be as close to the heart of things. Man, during this week of prayer and fasting, did God ever pull my heart back to the campus? Wow. 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 I mean, we walked it, we prayed up there, and I thought, oh, man, I love this place. And what's possible from this place, and the community, and the professional people, and the businesses, and the homeless folks, and the panhandlers, and the criminals, and everybody that has always revolved around every university that has ever existed. Uh, it, it's, but we have to have a facility that puts us close enough so that we can serve uh, the heart of the creative community here in the city. That is not possible. But then if we had gone with what's possible, I'd still be in the trees in Missouri. This place wasn't possible. The Durant wasn't possible. Having a children's director wasn't possible. Owning a keyboard, having the drum set, none of it is possible. I'm only interested in the stuff that can't be done. That's good. And that's why prayer has to be the center. 360 Homes is going to explode this year. Our small group Bible study network. Uh, if you're wondering, well, what's, if this all sounds all right, but kind of what's the next step I should take? Uh, we're going to have a big introduction of those next week and jump into one of them to 
let God's word get a hold of you and to connect with other people, really get connected and bonded together as we continue to grow. We're really excited about the growth of that. We're also really excited about what's going to happen with kids this year. I want to see more babies around here. So let's get on it. <laughs> okay, I want to do weddings first, all right? Let's keep our chronology in order here. But I want babies around here. You know, it's like, I want grandchildren. Have your parents been on you about that yet? Give it time, they will be. That's what I want. And I'm completely ready to pressure you right to the max to get what I'm asking for around here. It looks like our children's uh, program is going to fill up from the bottom, starting with the babies and older and older and older. Like three months, we'll have a youth group or something. I know that's what's going to happen. But that's going to be a, a, a powerful, powerful thing. And here's the last thing. I want to plant more churches from this place. This, if you're new to us, is not our end game. This is just a beginning here. I can't wait until the Lord shows us where our next plant goes. I see us eventually as a network of multiple locations around the Bay Area, around the region, uh, and uh, eventually uh, outside the United States. That there'll be 360s just everywhere. And you know the genesis of the next one might be in you. We look for what the Holy Spirit is doing in people and try to create environments where that can come out. We have a one-page playbook. That's how everything has worked from the beginning. That's how it always will work. Where is number two going to go? Jeff and Erica are doing great in Illinois. They've got a couple of house churches set up. It's just, it's really going well for them. They've got some funding. It looks like it's gonna be coming their way. We're thrilled about what's happening in their <coughs> lives. And I would be even twice as thrilled if we had a second one on the rails. Now we're not going to try to put that together in our own energy and strength and ideas. We need the spirit of God to show us how that is going to happen. But I never want to see a day when we're not asking the question, where does the next plant go? Now, I know that question's a challenge because it means not everybody's staying. So those are the two things I want. Babies <laughs> and leaving. Because if we're not sending people out both globally and here domestically to create new congregations, then we have lost something that there is no other way to recover. Listen, this place, this is an incubator, not a warehouse. Now, if we send out the way that church sent Natasha out to join, what will happen to us? We sow and we will, we will reap. And the reason I think some things are happening now is because we sent Jeff and Erica. And when we send the next group or team or person or whatever it is, God will do even more for us. And then we'll be able to do more for the world and more in terms of planting, more in terms of locations. And the cycle will continue, continue, continue. Our mission is to connect creatives to Christ so the world can become closer to God's vision of what it can be. If you want to become part of that, ask yourself this question, is this where I can serve? If it is, great. If it's not, great. There'll be someplace better where you can serve that'll really fit you, where you things will really work out for you. Uh, I just want you to know that it's a dangerous place. It's not physically dangerous, but it's an upset the apple carts kind of place. It's a derail your career and get you doing crazy stuff kind of place. It's a start caring about things you didn't care about before kind of place. It's a seeing things in a way you never saw them before kind of place. It's a giving more than you want to kind of place. It's an investing more time than you really got kind of place. It's asking your neighbor to come even though he's turned you down five times kind of place. It's that kind of place. It's an inconvenient place. But in that, we take hold of God and God takes hold of us. And that's where all the good stuff happens. Would you stand with me, please? I'm going to invite our band to come back and... Uh, lead us in some worship and as we bring our service towards the end here today this is also kind of officially the end of our month of prayer this moment right here and I'm just going to ask you today if you're a 
person who's been around a long time or you're a relatively new person, as we worship the Lord, would you just lift up our 2013? Let's do